you could go ahead and find your seats, we're gonna get started here. My name is Emily, and I'm currently serving as the president of Student Alumni Board. And I'm Morgan, the vice president of external programming. On behalf of the Student Alumni Board, we would like to welcome you to today's 10th annual Distinguished Young Alumni keynote presentation. Before we begin today's presentation, there are a few people and organizations that we would like to thank for making this event possible. First and foremost, we want to thank the Alumni Association and its board of directors for their continued support of DYA and all student alumni board programming. We specifically want to recognize the Alumni Association's president and CEO, Amy Button Renz. We would also like to thank President Richard Lenton. <laughs> President Lit Richard Lenton for his ongoing support and promotion of the Distinguished Young Alumni Program. Finally, we would like to extend a warm welcome to the families of our recipients who are with us today. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Student Alumni Board, SAB is a group of about 35 students who serve the university by providing a physical link between the Alumni Association and past, present, and future case staters. So over the past eight months, members of SAB have worked hard behind the scenes on the Distinguished Young Alumni Program to connect our current K-State students with some of our most passionate and accomplished K-State graduates at age 35 and under. So this year, we're excited to announce um, our Distinguished Young Alumni Award recipients, the 2023 honorees, John Grice and Kelsey Salazar. For the first keynote presentation, we are honored to welcome John Grice. Following John's keynote, we will open the floor for Q&A. At the conclusion of Q&A, there will be a reception with refreshments in the lobby outside of Wildcat Chambers. Please feel free to mingle and enjoy the treats. At 4.30, we will welcome Kelsey to the stage for the second keynote of the evening. Our first honoree today is a native of Manhattan, Kansas, who currently resides in Madison, Wisconsin, and serves as the annual giving manager for the Barack Obama Foundation. While at K-State, he was a member of Blue Key Senior Honorary, Delta Upsilon, Student Foundation, Student Alumni Board, K-State Debate, and Quest Freshman Honorary. He graduated in 2012 with a bachelor's, design, a bachelor's of Science degree in Political Science and a minor in Leadership Studies. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Grice. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for being here. Um, those of you in the back, there are a couple seats up front. If you get courageous and want to come all the way up, got some DUs back there. So uh, please just, I want to say thank you all for being here. With that, I want to say a special thank you to my family for being here. I want to say thank you to the student organizations um, that are here, um, old friends, colleagues, uh, folks from church. Uh, it seems like there's a little bit of everyone. So uh, for me, it feels good to be home and it feels very warm in this room and that wouldn't be possible without all of you who are here today, so thank you. So when I learned about this award, um, I decided I wanted to have a goal when I came back to campus, and that goal was really to provide value, particularly to the students. So those of you in the room who are currently K-State students, or maybe you're aspiring to be a K-State student, uh, my goal is to share with you a little bit about my experience, and hopefully after that, we'll all add some value to your day and to your year here as well. For those of you who are not yet a student or have been in the past, uh, feel free to hang around, enjoy the ride, uh, but I really do wanna to touch the students here in a way that um, we can connect and talk about how um, K-State has meant a great deal to me, and I hope it'll mean the same thing to you and possibly more. So here's a little bit of a roadmap for today's discussion. I'll do an introduction where I'll introduce myself, uh, tell you a little bit about me, some of the people in my life, and then we'll talk through my K-State experience I'll showcase kind of what I've been up to lately, and then I'll talk specifically about like my perspective on the current K-State experience uh, right now. And of course, if you have a question, I'll be very happy to answer any questions that y'all have. So as I said, I am a Manhattan kid. Uh, this is the, used to be the oldest Pizza Hut, uh, where I had several birthday parties. Uh, some good friends that are, in the, uh, that are in that picture I'm still friends with today. Um, but uh, you know, Manhattan is my home. Uh, I'm so proud to say that I grew up in the happiest place on earth, and it gave me so many memories and obviously so many relationships uh, that are still here today, and I'm very thankful to have this sort of homecoming where I get to um, reconnect with folks, uh, meet new people as well, and then really get to, to celebrate what K-State has become over time. 
As a young student, uh, I fell in love with leadership principles. This is a picture from, uh, from, -State, or from Kansas Boy State, uh, where I think I've had my first big leadership opportunity. Uh, that is in McCain Auditorium. I don't know if it looks that way still, but looking at all the rest of campus, it may not. It may have some evolution as well. But uh, that was at the debate where I got to also have my like, first big taste at like, a competitive debate, which we have some folks from debate here too, so that's really been, been special. But I look at this photo and I think about how it was a pivotal moment for me where I was able to start leading in practice and start to uh, lead my peers. And what I didn't know is that that was really gonna forecast a lot of my experience at K-State and what I think makes it so special here because oftentimes at K-State we get hands-on experience with leading people and it certainly grew me into who I was. So I get to K-State and I realize uh, Kelsey, um, that is us up there. I didn't realize until like 10 minutes before the presentation that you're in this as well. Uh, but that was our Quest Freshman Honorary. When I got to K-State, I was just like, I gotta get involved. I'm gonna do it as fast as I can. I decided that I was gonna, uh, I moved into Marlette Hall, uh, and then I joined Quest Freshman Honorary, uh, met some great people. Um, this is a picture of us at, uh, I think it was like an all night walk. It was at the old A. Her Hernfield House, and that was a really, that was just some of the first people that really introduced me to K-State. Taught me behavioral-based interviewing, taught me how to learn all about campus, and was a true launching point for what K-State experience. But I was also doing this other thing called collegiate debate. Uh, and Alex in the back of the room is currently leading the K-State debate team. And uh, this is a picture with just us going across the country uh, to debate tournaments. We'd load up in a K-State van and we'd, we'd leave on like a Thursday or Friday and then we'd end up uh, going to beautiful places like Colorado. And sometimes we'd end up in places like uh, Utah. And then sometimes we end up in Idaho, and this was actually my first spring break at Kansas State, was going to Pocatello, Idaho. That memory just came back to me. It was, we were coming back and then we ended up getting stuck in a snowstorm in Wyoming. Um, but uh, debate meant so much to me because it taught me how to critically think, it taught me how to work uh, with a team, how to anticipate things uh, with other folks, uh, we, being really well read on specific subjects. Uh, I learned so much for debate that I think that gave me a great foundation at K-State to then go do other things. So I wasn't gonna become a lawyer, uh, but I did learn a lot of skill sets that I think made me successful today. And then I met a guy in Quest who asked me to come to a dinner at his fraternity house. I was like, sure, I'll go for a free meal. That sounds great to me. <laughs> Ryan Wilkerson, who's in the room, was probably one of my first deepest K-State friends. Uh, and so thank you for Ryan for coming. But we met in Quest and uh, he talked me into coming to uh, a chapter meeting, and then that chapter meeting it was the, the chapter where all the seniors say goodbye. And they get to tell their stories and all the lessons they've learned, maybe similar to how I'm doing it today. And that got me involved, and I was like, you know, I think this might be something. So my freshman year, I decided that I wanted to join a fraternity, and I joined Delta Upsilon. Thank you guys for being in the crowd today. I really look forward to talking with you more this week. Uh, but that certainly propelled me and built so many more relationships. I remember picking DU because I saw what all the DUs were doing across campus. They were student body president, they were student alumni board president. They were doing all these things where I saw they were making an impact and that certainly told me that based on my past experience that this is a place where I might be able to learn and continue to grow from as well. And I did. Uh, I got involved with student, uh, student uh, excuse me, uh, Student Governing Association uh, and then convinced Ryan to be my campaign manager. <laughs> and we then started uh, chalking on the ground visiting all the student organizations we could possibly see, crafting a vision for what we hoped K-State could become. And we wanted to do that work together um, at K-State because we'd experienced so much of it uh, as students and we knew that we could better K-State with our experiences that we've learned. So we ended up running uh, with Natalie Roth, who is, uh, my, uh, was my vice presidential candidate. And I think we're at a pancake feed and someone thought it'd be funny to pancake our names. <laughs> I'm not sure it converted to many votes, but it was certainly good to look at. Uh, and of course, K-State Proud, which this is my most formative experience. Um, I will often say, and I've said it several times with the students I've talked here with today, is that I think the K-State provides a truly holistic learning experience um, and college experience. I believe I probably got my education outside the classroom. Uh, I definitely went to class at most times. <laughs> but so many things I learned uh, came from moments where I got hands-on learning at K-State. They're, they're helping to build the K-State Proud campaign into what students have then grown even beyond that. It was thinking critically about campaigns. It was thinking about how we can galvanize people and to inspire a college student who is sometimes just trying to like pay for lunch that day. 
to see the impact that they can make in someone's life if they can either make a sacrifice, make a small contribution, because it's so important to keeping students here. So this is a picture of us, uh, the co-chairs for that year. Um, this was the, I can't remember what year it is, but it was the second black shirt, and I remember that being really, really popular um, and selecting that, um, that shirt, and it was so much fun. And we were able to raise a ton of money. And I remember right before this moment where we were on the court, uh, I asked Minnie Wexelman, like, how much do we raise? And she wouldn't tell us. After like Thursday of the crowd campaign, she'd just go dark on the numbers, and she just, we would have to just like wait and see. And so here we are at half court. If we were doing video, I would have like populated a video, which is on YouTube if you want to go look. Uh, it's of them announcing it. And then I do this little like jump. <laughs> Not a lot of clearance on the bottom, but. <laughs> I just remember being struck with like so much joy for what we had worked toward uh, and how much that will help change people's lives through the funds that we were able to raise that were from students and alumni uh, as well. So we were so excited for uh, that moment. I'll always cherish that picture. And I do apologize for some of the darkness of the pictures. Uh, back then I was pulling, I had to like find pictures like I think that was taken on like a Blackberry. So <laughs> not really on the iPhone, whatever it's not these days. So summing up, this is like kind of my K-State journey. I did a lot of things. Uh, I tried to get as involved as I could, but I really wanted to make an impact on K-State and the folks that were around me. What I didn't know is that they would really be moments that would be crafting a pathway for me into my future and what my career would become and what I could accomplish for folks um, well beyond graduation and to this day and what I hope to accomplish uh, well into the future. So I just decided that I wanted to do something that was gonna really tr be transformative uh, to our communities. And I, the more I learned about it, I learned that the role that foundations can play, especially when it comes to universities, uh, it can be really important. And particularly, not just any universities, but like land grant universities. Uh, universities that are there for the betterment of their communities. Universities that are there to provide access and affordability to education. And I just love that concept. And I was taught that concept right here at Kansas State. And it became really a core component of my belief system, and I believe that education should be affordable. So I made a little road trip uh, and had several stops in my career. I've been out of K-State, I graduated in 2012, so it's 2023, so it's like 11 years or so, uh, but I've made several stops along the way. The first stop was at uh, Kansas State University. I worked with the annual giving team here. Our goal was to inspire K-Staters to uh, make gifts of any size, but typically those gifts were um, less than $25,000. And that was the component of the work that I've been doing at all three of these locations. But I remember at K-State that it really taught me all the ways that I can um, fundraise and how we can reach people either by phone, email, text, how we can story tell, and also how to do it the, the right way, the way that brings joy to people's hearts and doing things that maybe isn't always just about uh, being the, you know, the cheapest way to do it, but we have to do it the right way. Went down to Oklahoma State, got a chance to really dive deep into digital fundraising, finding ways that we can uh, embrace the change that's happened in the world to be able to crowdfund and like launch their first giving day where on a single day we were raising millions of dollars from people giving all, gifts of all sizes. And then knew I had this bug that I wanted to go lead people. I caught it from here, this place. And I learned all the best practices for how to do it from here, this place. So I had an opportunity to go to Wisconsin they had a team of about three people, um, and I was able to go to that team, and then we were able to tackle some challenges. Uh, this is always also during the time of COVID, so it was a little bit, that was a quite a big challenge of leading people during that time. But we were able to grow that team from three to 15 people, uh, raising more revenue, but all the, the work that we did was designed to make sure that education can be affordable and accessible for those that aspire to be here. So I continue to develop my belief, my belief set. I, you know, I believe that the power of philanthropy is in the hands of passionate people. People like um, many of you in this crowd, um, you all have the ability to effectuate change with your passion that you have. And it's only made possible when we're really just passionate about it and we show ourselves, we tell our stories, and then we connect with people. And through our, my work, I've learned how to connect with folks when we're raising money. And I think that it's certainly a, a joy of my life. And it really, it's not just about trying to ask people for money just because we want to do it. It's about sharing their passion with them and effectuating change in people's lives. So I've had a few career moments that uh, are my favorite in thinking about all those steps that I've gone through. Uh, and the first one is from uh, my time here at Kansas State. Uh, the first couple years, I spent two years there, um, they were challenging. There were some things that happened where uh, I learned that like 
our staff members aren't there forever. <laughs> and they like go and do other things. And there are spaces where, for me to like step up. And I think I was taught there that there will be opportunities for you professionally where you'll be able to um, step up, raise your hand, uh, take up the work of other folks that, uh, that need your help, and you'll be able to start to learn tremendous things. And those opportunities sometimes are unexpected. They don't always happen, but in my time at K-State, because of the series of events that happened, I was able to get a really broad education about um, philanthropy. I was able to learn phonathon. I was able to learn direct mail. I was able to learn uh, leadership annual giving, so folks to give a little bit more. And I think that because of that, it set me up to go to other places and really be able to become a specialist and really develop my skill set. At Oklahoma State, I was able to take what I learned all so much about mentoring here at, uh, at Kansas State and to be able to uh, mentor people that were in my field, uh, to be able to grow students like many of you who were interested in this idea of, you know, I didn't know you could do that job. And to be able to like help raise money that can help build things on campus or to be able to make scholarships possible or to set up programs and to be able to talk with those students about what they aspire to do and to be able to mentor them and help them find their pathway to their career. And so there are several folks that, um, that now do jobs similar to mine. And I think that I'm so proud of those moments because the ability to help someone find their pathway, um, I don't really need them to, it doesn't need them to do exactly what I did, but for them to find their own passion for this and then to be able to help support them and mentor them. I think the opportunity to mentor is incredibly important. And also uh, leading and innovating through a pandemic. Uh, I was at University of Wisconsin from 2018 to 2022 in June. So we had just got going and I just like learned the job, started building the team. And then I got this note that says, hey, everyone's gonna have to go home. And we, that was in March of 2020. And I never stepped foot back into the office at Wisconsin. So during that time, I had to figure out how to lead my team of 15 in a way that took care of their whole selves because during that time, people were bringing everything they had to work. And I think that we had to see people as whole people. They were sitting at home, worried about their family. They were worried about maybe someone losing a job. They were worried about things at work changing. Um, everything that, as I knew it, how, how we lead people in the workplace had changed when the pandemic hit. So having to adapt to that, uh, figure out how we can really take care of people, managing up with our leadership and saying like, hey, we got to pause. Like people are going to lose it right now if we keep pressing. And so being able to take care of people's expectations in that way um, taught me so much. And it also, I think, made me more empathetic as a human being um, and being able to see, because I got to, got to see the, the kids on camera and got to just see like, I mean, you're, it's kind of intimate because you're like in people's homes all of a sudden when I never would have gone into their house before probably. So it just opened up a whole new view of the workplace. And it taught me so much about leadership and seeing people, which is actually really helpful because now I work completely remotely. Uh, so it's, um, it's kind of a, it's a new journey, but it certainly taught me lots of lessons. So here's what I'm chasing now. I currently work for the Barack Obama Foundation. Uh, I started in June of 2022. Uh, it is a fully remote role, but I make trips to Chicago and DC where we have offices uh, often. And I like to share with you all a little bit about my work today and how I think that we're conti I'm continuing to try to change the, uh, change the world and learn, taking all the principles I've learned so far into this work. So I'll introduce the Barack Obama Foundation because it may be new to some folks, either here or online. Um, the Barack Obama Foundation was founded in January of 2017, so it is only five years old. Unlike the three previous employers of mine, it's brand new. It has a definite startup vibe. Um, while we may know the, uh, the Obamas, and we certainly, many of us were around during the presidency, um, the foundation and its work is really growing rapidly presently. So our mission is to inspire, empower, and connect people to change their world. Uh, we do that in multiple different ways. So the first is that we ensure access to education for adolescent girls. Um, all across the globe, there are, uh, there are young women who are um, struggling to stay in the classroom because of either childhood marriage or it may be um, commitments to pick up water and all types of different um, societal challenges that keep them out of the classroom. Our belief is that if you can get a girl to, to school, that she'll change her world. And so we're really committed to solving some of those challenges that will keep them in the classroom. The second is teaching change makers values-based leadership. Uh, we learn quite a bit about values-based leadership here at K-State. And uh, we use the platform of the Obamas to connect people all across the globe. We have cohorts in Asia, uh, Europe, uh, Africa, and also the United States of great change makers who are either 
they're mayors, they're leaders of nonprofits, they're doing things in their communities, and we want to connect them so they can learn from each other, learn values-based leadership, and then we believe that that will propel them to further change the world. We make sure there's safe space for young boys and men of color um, across. There are lots of people doing that work in many different communities. We want to ensure that that becomes the case and it stays that way. And lastly, we're raising money for the Presidential Center, which will be on the south side of Chicago. Uh, it'll be a home for many of those programs, but then also it'll be a place for the south side and for many people to learn about the work of the Obamas and otherwise. Those are big things um, that we're trying to solve. Uh, they certainly aren't going to be solved today, but I think we should start today. Uh, as life is so short, so I think we should be audacious. I think that not only at the work of the Obama Foundation, uh, which is why I share that work with you, because I say, let, let's dream big. Um, let's start to think about what are you going to do in your life that'll be big, and can you create some sort of hope that you can then transform into action? And I think that because life is so short, we have to be audacious in our work. So here's how we're kind of audacious in the work that we do. So in my work, I try to raise money from as many people as possible using direct mail, email, phone, uh, SMS, door canvassing. We, like, we're trying everything because we're so new to fundraising that we're really starting to build this program for the first time. Uh, I started there and I was like a team of one uh, and I was the only person starting to build this program. Uh, but we're seeing that we're raising money that are solving some of these great challenges. Here's a picture of one of the summer projects that we had. It was uh, called Local Lunchbox um, during the summer, especially in places like Chicago. You have folks that uh, don't have access to lunch, particularly kids. Um, and so we wanted to provide for them meals, but also that meals that are uh, culturally uh, relevant for them. So let's not just like package up some Jimmy John's. Let's give them good food that is going to mean something to them and where they come from. We're participating in a Get Her There campaign presently. Um, this is a photo of uh, several women that uh, we have uh, Michelle Obama, Amal Clooney, and also um, Melinda French Gates and a couple others that are there working together, all thinking about how we can help out our young, our young women. And because we believe that we can get her into school, she can change her world. And also, we think that we can combine communities, get them working together, and we can take care of our young boys and men of color. And there's a photo of the, the Presidential Center that'll be hopefully opening up in October of 2025. So what I've learned from this work is, you know, a, a few fold. So I think that it's, it's hard starting from the, from the beginning. Uh, the, we weren't doing any type of direct response fundraising, uh, doing that annual giving work that, that I learned at Kansas State and all those other places. It was really hard to start from the very beginning. Like there's no documentation, there's no nothing. We have to sign contracts with vendors to like get started. Um, overwhelming, it's like where do you start? How do you prioritize? How do you move quickly with a sense of urgency? Um, because these are big problems. We don't want to wait and drag our feet. So uh, it's hard to start from, the, from zero, but it's so worth it to see this success work, to see the, the students that have great meals that were funded by dollars that came in from donors. Um, it truly makes a difference to be able to, to do it the right way. And that's what we're trying to do. If you're starting from nothing, you have a great opportunity to do it the right way, not just the way that we've always done it before. And I think in many of our professional roles, uh, I think in, that you'll experience maybe things at K-State or student organizations, like you're, why are we doing this? Because, well, that's what we did last year. And I think that the opportunity to start something new. So if you're entrepreneurial at all, uh, certainly consider like the value in starting from nothing. I felt like when I went to Oklahoma State that I knew uh, quite a lot about fundraising. I think that uh, Mindy taught me that I have a lot to, to learn still. Uh, and I think that that's, that's great. I think that she taught me so much. Um, but when I got to, by the time I went to Wisconsin as well, I had learned even more. But when I got to the Bond Foundation, it was just like, wow, there's so much I don't know yet. Uh, so know that you can always grow, even once you have this decade of experience. My, um, our chief development officer at the Obama Foundation, Danny McGregor, he <coughs> taught me to obsess about systems, uh, to really get, um, to think and ask lots of questions. Um, because you'll start to figure things out. Some things maybe aren't working the way they should. Um, so just really obsess about those systems. And also, we want to have leaders that are worth following. For me, K-State certainly empowered through the Proud campaign, this thought that you know, we can change our world. Sorry if y'all heard that gulp. <laughs> but, but there's a you know, the special component about like that ordinary people, just me, just a kid that used to have his you know, pizza parties at Pizza Hut uh, in Manhattan, Kansas, that 
We can have, if we dream big, we can start to accomplish things. And it, well, there's a road to get there, and it may go straight like a straight line, like a lot of my career, it also may wind. But um, certainly when we come together, we can create change. So Casey taught me lots of lessons. I'm going to maybe rapid fire through some photos uh, that capture those lessons and a little bit of text. Uh, so here's my top 10 things I learned from K-State. There's an order, but it's not prioritized. I just kind of was thinking. So first, go to the game <laughs> as early as possible. Here's a photo of me and the DUs. We were always like committed to being on the front row. Uh, I have memories of uh, saying some things to Patrick Mahomes when he came here. And uh, <laughs> we both go our separate ways now. <laughs> but certainly go to the game as early as possible. And I think when you do, you have moments like this where you just have a riled up crowd um, right in the front, and I'm in this very dark corner over here. <laughs> um, but go as fast, go, go to the games. Uh, take those moments, spend a little extra time, get in front of the line, it's such a great experience. Uh, your experience will prepare you for anything here. Uh, this is a couple photos of my earliest debate coaches, uh, Justin and Sarah Green, who taught me so much. Uh, everything from how to research properly to how to prepare for a debate, how to construct an argument. Uh, and I think the lesson I remember the most is don't stay up super late if you're like have a big day and you have more to prepare. Go to bed and wake up early. You'll be better for that. So instead of staying up till 2 a.m., 3 a.m., pulling an all-nighter, just go to sleep, get a couple hours, then wake up early. You'll be more productive. And sometimes you'll win tournaments and hopefully you won't wear jean shorts like that. <laughs> I couldn't resist that photo. Well, I could, but whatever. Uh, enjoy the marinated moments. Uh, I think this is probably, uh, when I thought about this, I was thinking like some barbecue reference and smoking meat and just like, you're just sitting there and just like letting the process happen and enjoying it. Jeff Fawn has still taught me a lot about that and just enjoying those moments. And I think this is, this is a picture of my blue key class and it's not an attractive picture. We're all looking the wrong direction, but it was on my Facebook, so I grabbed it. And uh, I just remember with that group, we were all so busy on campus and doing so many things. Uh, but then there were moments where we just slowed down and we're able to just enjoy each other's company, enjoy each other's um, experiences in life, make memories with each other. Uh, sometimes there are road trips that are planned, sometimes there are road trips that are unplanned, uh, but just really enjoy those marinated moments as students that you have. Certainly believe in yourself. You have immeasurable ability to do great things in the world. And I think if you believe that you can and you work hard to do it, then you certainly can, similar to our audacious goals with K-State Proud that year. Stay focused. So when I graduated um, high school, um, my mom, who um, she's been with me my whole life, <laughs> um, she wrote on my tassel um, two words and was stay focused. Uh, I don't really, like, we never really talk about like what does that really mean, so I've kind of created my own uh, version of what that means, but um, as you develop your goal and what you want to do, like keep a focus on that. Uh, write it down, think about it, um, really work towards it, um, because it'll, if you have that focus, you'll be able to get through it when things are tough, uh, when there are lots of distractions. Uh, so I would encourage you to think about staying focused. Uh, so when you fail, lift your head uh, and look around. Um, this is a picture of Natalie and I again. Um, this was our, we did a photo shoot because Natalie wanted to do a photo shoot in our shirts and for marketing things, I was not so happy about that. <laughs> but uh, as running mates, we, we worked hard. We tried so hard to make this work. Uh, Ryan did a ton of work on the campaign and a lot of other friends uh, really tried to help, um, our slogan was like, your team for progress, uh, to help K-State progress. Um, well, it didn't really turn out the way that we hoped, uh, and that's okay, um, because when we failed and found out that we lost the election, I remember there was this night, we were like, okay, how are we gonna heal this wound? And we thought, okay, let's go out to Aggieville. And <laughs> I think back to this photo, and think about the people that I still know and talk to today, and think about, you know, those are folks that were like on their hands and knees, like on the hard cement, like writing my name and our campaign on the ground. And that's like, that's hard work, that's committed work. And I'm so thankful for those people. And in the moment where I experienced probably the, the first big failure as a K-State student that I had, um, that if I just like look up and look around me, I see that I have really great support network here. And those folks are there to this day. So you gotta show up for each other. So this photo is, the very first photo I could find of Ryan. I, obviously I'm saying a lot about Ryan, but that just tells you like how much he was a part of my student experience. We were in all the student organizations together. We lived together. We're still friends to this day. Um, but this was uh, the Kassbaum Scholars. 
uh, getting to know each other is our very first big photo. Um, but what I'll tell you is that um, when you leave this place, um, you will have some really great moments. You'll have some really hard moments. You'll, you're, I hope this isn't your case, but there will be some dark moments in your life. And uh, Ryan was able to show up for me in one of my really dark moments. Uh, and I think that that is something that will always mean a ton to me, Ryan. So thank you for that. Um, but just know that you're going to meet folks here who are going to show up for you later. So build those relationships. Be really intentional about deepening them and help them stay around. Uh, it's going to take some sacrifice, but it will certainly pay off in the end. A couple more pictures. We went to Europe together. There's more jean shorts. Uh, I'm so glad I got out of that. <laughs> well, singing and, you know, karaoke. Um, and, of course, he was there um, in that moment uh, when I just raised my head and looked up around me. Uh, so uh, this is a photo of the, like, the OG annual giving team or part of it. Um, and uh, one thing that I learned early on in my career is that I'm going to run 1,000 miles per hour, and then the transmission is going to fall out of the car. <laughs> I'm just going to break down. And uh, one of the things that I learned very early on is to strive for consistency. Um, two other words that I wrote down and I put on my keyboard is like stay consistent. Um, I think that as young professionals, after you leave here, you'll have the opportunity to do some great jobs and hopefully you'll do great work, but take care of yourself. Uh, being 150% one day and then being 20% the next day is volatile. <laughs> and I think that it's important to really think about bringing your whole self to work uh, and your whole self to class, your student organizations, but also take care of yourself, find your consistency so that you can be great as often as possible. Um, and that may mean that you have to like, take some breaks uh, so you don't burn yourself out. And I think mentor and be mentored, this is the darkest photo I, I could possibly find, but it's the iPhone uh, photo as well. But uh, there's another mentor of mine in there, um, and his name's Damian Williams. He was the first person that I met that looked like me that did what I wanted to do. Uh, and he was a fundraiser. I met him at K-State. Um, it meant a lot. I remember getting off the elevator and him like, look, he was new, and like, I looked at him, and like, we had a conversation about like, where to get your hair cut, because uh, it's, it's an experience that a lot of black men have when they move to a new community. And I think that he, that relationship grew, and he became a mentor and coached me, and I think that as a part of your careers, and even, don't even wait till you have a career, like start now, like find mentors, mentor other folks. Uh, it's a really special experience. And last is one of my favorite places on campus. Uh, it's right in the middle of the quad, at least the last time I looked it was in the middle of the quad, I don't know <laughs> it's, it's gone, but uh, it says, it's a sundial and it says, grow old along with me, the best is yet to be. And the last thing I'll leave you with is a lesson that I probably learned after K-State, um, but certainly if I look back I can see moments like that while I'm at K-State is, it's one thing to love someone and say that you love them, and to take care of them uh, is a totally different thing. Uh, I think it's really important to um, do the action verb of that word. So as you look around in this room, you go back home, you think about the people that mean something to you, like many of the people I've shared with you, uh, really think about how you can do an action that really shows up for them every single time. So there's a snapshot, my top 10. Uh, thank you for letting me share those with you. It's been such a pleasure to be back on campus. It's been a pleasure to, to show you more of myself and what I've been up to so far, and absolutely grateful for all of you that are here, or streaming online. Uh, thank you so much. Um, please, let's stay in touch. Thank you so much, John. We would now like to welcome everyone here uh, to the lobby just outside the Wildcat Chamber to enjoy some refreshments. Do you want uh, to do questions? Oh, yeah, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Okay. Uh, on your mentor and be mentored, what does good mentorship look like to you? Mm. So I think mentor, like good mentorship is, I'd say it's, it can be formal. And I think that um, I've learned that you can have a conversation with someone that you think will be a good mentor and to have a structure to it. Um, there should be a timeline of like, let's do this for a year. Um, there should be expectations about we'll talk every week, every month, uh, we'll have lunch, coffee, whatever it may be. And people should know what the mentorship is, the scope of the mentorship. Uh, can be. So I may need mentorship help on being a young professional. And so I might find someone who's recently been a young professional and say, hey, 
over the next year, I like to talk with you about once a month about what it's like to be a living professional. I'd love to get your advice. So I think that there's some criteria to it. I think that if you don't have some type of structure and a conversation, at least at the very beginning, then it can start to, it can go off course sometimes, or it may not be, you may talk one month and then not talk for several other months. Uh, it, it, there's accountability there, and I think that's important in mentorship. Top three favorite memories from K-State when you were a student. So top three favorite memories of K-State when I was a student. Uh, I think that I'm gonna bundle some here. There were some big athletic wins. Uh, and I, I remember when I think we beat KU and just there was a dead sprint to Aggieville from like wherever you were. So people were just like you, it was so strange. You would just be driving down North Manhattan and you just would see like dead sprinters, like coming from Haymaker and Ford, just going down there. Not everyone's like just going to the bars. Like it was just like, just be in Aggieville, just be in the middle of that street. And I think that, that I think about the energy of that moment. And that was really, uh, really great. Um, I think about the, let's see. I'd say that another great memory was certainly the, the Proud campaign booth. Um, there are lots of memories. Uh, K-State Proud's a, a campaign that raises money from students for students, uh, where students are really helping each other stay um, at, at K-State. And um, to be able to be at that booth and to uh, stand across the, you know, across the way from uh, one of my peers and, and make an ask for them to, you know, I think donate $10 at the time, uh, inflation. <laughs> but it has been, uh, that's a really special moment to think about, like just that, that, that transaction happening. And it's really not transactional, it's relational. Uh, because we're all students here, we're all taking care of each other, and I think it makes a big difference. And uh, I remember there was one guy who was like, "Hey, I like to, you know, donate to K State Proud." And he came in, and it was a cold day, and he had like a, a parka on and no shirt underneath. And the the deal with K State Proud is like, uh, we're accepting your donations, and as a way to celebrate your um, your support, like here's a T-shirt that you can wear and help share the, more of the message with folks. Uh, and he just said, "No, I don't need a T-shirt." And I was like, "You kind of look like you do." <laughs> Uh, and a, a third one, I think, would probably be, uh, I have so many great memories from, from debate. Um, it was such an um, immersive experience where I think that, I mean, I've heard before that the amount of research you do as a debater um, would qualify for like um, master's level research. Um, it, is, it is a tremendous amount of work and like the late nights in the squad room, the travel all abroad, and knowing what it did for me today certainly is like a great memory. Yeah, Alex. John, thanks for shouting out debate so much. We really appreciate and love seeing our uh, debate alumni do really great. Uh, one of the things that I always like talking to our debate alumni about are the debates that they get into after college, and a lot of them miss the you know competitive, argumentative spirit. Have you won or lost any big uh, you know debates in your? Oh, he always wins. Yeah. Are you so sure about that, John? Have yeah. you won or lost any big debates recently? No. Uh, so I think that, uh, so the question was, you know, are there any debates that I've uh, I won or lost? And like, am I always winning? And my sister shouted out that I think I always win, uh, which is true. Uh, no, I, but I think that as you go through life and you start to form relationships, uh, especially ones that are um, more emotionally based, uh, you start to learn that you shouldn't debate. <laughs> So, so yeah, I think that you know professionally, uh, certainly there are moments where I thought something was important, and I've poured my energy and resource into crafting a great argument, and it just lands on deaf ears, or it lands on ears that are thinking about something else at that moment. So I think that's something to to consider is that it's not just a it's not objective, it's not right or wrong. It's sometimes about timing. It's not it's not no, it's not not it's not no, it's not right now, um, or. Um, Maybe next quarter, or maybe never, but I'm going to tell you not now. <laughs> so, yeah, in the back. What is one piece of advice you would give to students who are looking for organizations on campus that fit um, their specific goals and how to stand out besides the others? Yeah, so um, I think if you're looking for organizations around campus, and like, what's my advice if you want to, if, to find organizations that meet your goals? Is that right? Yeah, so I'm sure the K State has like a career career fairs and organization fairs, uh, certainly go to those things. Uh, right now, I feel like so much is more 
connected. Like if I was at case and I didn't know like all the things I could do, I'd probably just hit up social media because uh, everyone's trying to tell their story there. Uh, and you might be able to, to find those organizations, but also see their work that's happening. And I think, you know, you're not, you don't have to stay in the student organization. Like you can quit things. So you can like try stuff. And if it doesn't work or if it doesn't, uh, I don't think you should just join and just quit life, stuff in life. But uh, you can certainly uh, join, see if it works, if it's meeting its goals. And if it isn't aligning, then you can uh, give it time and then reassess. I, I think that the, the core, like the thread, was leadership, uh, I think. And I really got to know a lot of different leadership organizations on campus. Um, I will say that I, I graduated with a political science major. Uh, I think I probably should have tried out some more classes. Um, I did enjoy my political science experience, but I did know like my senior year uh, that I was like, man, I really like this history class. Or, I really like this biology class. And I, I wish I would have like, preloaded like you probably should, your uh, like gen ed type classes. So you really get a really broad experience and figure out what you really like. And then you can kind of go deep with those things. Yes. How do you find inspiration for fresh fundraising ideas when so many other organizations out there are also asking for money? How do you stand out? Yeah, so I, um, one of the things I've really enjoyed about my career is being able to, uh, the question was, how do I find inspiration uh, for fundraising ideas um, as so many other organizations are doing similar things? Uh, I think that, especially higher ed philanthropy, I think we've been behind the curve in a lot of the work that we do. Uh, we're doing that we're slow to move in many ways, uh, and I think that we have to like work faster. Um, I get to work as fast as I can possibly work, <laughs> given that I'm one of the only people on the team uh, doing work, the work we do right now. Uh, but I looked for other experiences in my life because I believe that we are so e-commerce, um, whether it's you know all these companies are emailing us every day, creating this experience of where we're buying things. Uh, that work is um, transforming, that, that's transforming our behavior. So if I'm doing the same thing in fundraising that I always have done, but we have, you know, businesses and things that are transforming how our people like to engage with folks, uh, I, need to, I need to change how I do because my population I'm raising money for is changing. So one thing that we, uh, I do is I look at what are the experiences, like what's my Gmail look like? And like what am I seeing? Because that's what everyone else is seeing and that's what people are connecting with. I think the last thing that I do is I watch a lot of YouTube. <laughs> and I think that there's so much content out there. It's one of the most watched uh, social media channels. And I think you can just learn from other places of how people tell stories. I think we have time for one more question if someone has something burning. Joe? Yeah. Um, how, can you give some helpful tips, maybe a couple, one or two, of how students are going from their collegiate career, right, as graduates, to um, a corporate career and how they can still find, have value and add value to, to wherever they're going after? Yeah, so um, the question was, how can, what advice do I have for students who are leaving their college career and then going into potentially a corporate career and how can they add value, is that right? I would meet as many people as you possibly can and get to know them. Um, I think that the moments where you can just have even a five minute conversation with them and ask them uh, what's going on in their life. Uh, I think that asking, not just saying like, hey, how's your day? And they say good, like say like, what's good about it? Or sometimes they'll surprise you and say that it's bad. Um, and then you really get to learn a little bit more about that person. Because I think that a lot of the, the corporate world or just like life after college will just still like center on relationships. Uh, so think about how can you d learn more about um, the relationships you have with folks and build those relationships and learn from people. Uh, you can learn lots of things from many people. And it doesn't have to be like something massive. It can really be just learning how to do the simple stuff at work. Um, and I think that staying in touch with those folks. Um, there are people to this day that have that I've worked with nine years ago that I still talk to and learn from. Uh, and I think that that is something that is really valuable. So once you leave, uh, learn everything. Like keep learning and also stay connected with folks. Thank you all. Uh, after this, we'll have, uh, I guess I won't do your job. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it's fine, it's fine. But it. yes, uh, there's refreshments just outside there in the lobby. If you guys will come back in 10 minutes, we'll start with Kelsey. So thank you so much. Thank you.
If you could go ahead and find your seats, we'll get started momentarily. At this time, I have the honor of welcoming our second Distinguished Young Alumni recipient to the stage, Kelsey Salazar. A native of Eureka, Kansas, she is currently a registered nurse, clinical care coordinator, and clinical nurse educator, educator for internal medicine at the University of Kansas Health System. While at K-State, she was an active member of Student Alumni Board, Human Ecology Council, Quest, Silver Key, Chimes, Mortarboard, Alpha Chi Omega, an SGA intern, an orientation leader, and a Wildcat warm-up director. She graduated in 2011 and received her Bachelor's of Science in Family Studies and Human Services. Kelsey then obtained her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Kansas in 2013. Please join me in welcoming Kelsey Salazar. Thank you all so much for being here today. This, I still can't believe I'm amongst John and the other past DIYA, DYA award winners. It just, it's an incredibly humbling honor and I don't feel like I meet the match of those groups, but it is a memory I will cherish forever. So thank you to Amy and Tammy and Andrea and the Student Alumni Board. You are an incredible group. Have Morgan and Libby and um, Emily, you all have worked so hard. So thank you all for having me here today. And I'm so excited to be back home in Manhattan. It's not my original home, but it'll always be home to me. So thank you for having us, having me back. So I'm gonna start out a little bit talking to you about where my journey began. So K-State has been ingrained in us from day one. Mama raised this right. You can tell in this photo, there's someone in our family who never figured out the right colors to wear. Uh, sorry, Dad. But we got him trained right. He's got his purple on today. So um, we've always been K-Staters, um, bled purple through and through. Um, my mom was a K-Stater and um, have loved it since day one. So coming to K-State was never a question. Um, we had it planned from the day we were born. So um, I was born and raised in southeast Kansas in Eureka a little one stoplight town where there's more cows than people. Um, it was absolutely the best childhood I could have ever imagined though. I live in Lenexa now, so I call it the big city. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are from the Kansas City area and laugh at that, but um, for fun in Eureka, Kansas was going in the backfield and riding four wheelers and um, going down to the creek and catching frogs with dad on the four wheeler. So um, you couldn't ever, imagine growing up in a town like Eureka. There's not a lot there now, but um, the kids love it too and go back and ride four-wheelers and playing softball in the backfield. So it was an incredible um, journey and where it all began back in Eureka. So I have one husband, Zach, um, who graduated from K-State in 2013, a sister, Jamie, who graduated with her BS in 2010 and is also a past DYA um, award winner. So it's really exciting to still be following in her footsteps as a K-Stater. 
and I have three kiddos in the picture up here with Willie who I never thought there would be bigger K-Staters than myself and my sister growing up, but these three are die-hard fans. So I have one um, older girl, Carly, who is seven, who lives and breathes some K-State football. Um, Landry, who's four, who lives and breathes the tailgates and snacks at halftime. <laughs> and Callan, who will be one at the end of this month, who is just excited watching all the people. So <laughs> love to bring them to K-State and have already got their K-State college funds going, so they're ready to go. Like I said, we, drew, we grew up K-Staters, so we used to take our naps on the, on the benches on the football uh, stadium, which can't do that now these days, thanks to Coach Schneider, but um, K-State was a dream. Like, my kids call it that it's better than going to Disney World, coming to Manhattan, and that means something. So Manhattan has always been man happiness to us and forever will be. So I have a strong family history. My mom graduated from K-State um, Communication Sciences and Disorders and is a speech language pathologist. Um, I have two aunts that also graduated in education and business, an uncle who is completing his PhD here, and then multiple cousins. So strong um, family history of Wildcats. So it was never a question whether I was gonna get my education here at K-State or not. Um, K-State was also you know, my home away from home. Amy and Tammy and Andrea, they became like family that I got to know through Jamie and her experiences and um, Everyone here was family, though. Um, not e the people that I met through Jamie, but just growing up. Like, it felt like home. It always did. So it was never a question. Um, I was surrounded by family, and it was a personal feel. You had all the opportunities of a big university, but you had that small town feel, which is what I was used to. That's what I wanted. I grew up like that in Eureka, and so it was the perfect match to get my career started. So a little bit about my undergraduate story at K-State. Um, I was here from 2007 to 2011, um, majored in Family Studies, Human and Services with a secondary major in Gerontology. Um, I had a very strict agenda when I was coming to K-State. Um, from a very young age, I knew I wanted to be a nurse. I had a lot of experiences in the healthcare field personally, um, more with family and my sister and her health challenges throughout the years. So I knew exactly what I wanted to do, um, but I didn't know how to get there. K-State did not have a nursing school program, which they do now, and I'm super jealous, but um, fantastic developments have been made here, which is awesome. Um, but I didn't want to lose out on that K-State experience. So the normal nursing track is to go to nursing school, um, do your undergraduate coursework, and then go to nursing school your second two years. So I didn't want to miss out on that time to grow and develop and have all those opportunities of that college experience. So I credit my path to my mom who had me come up to K-State. She's like, let's go make a plan, let's talk to the advisors. And I was like, I know I wanna come to K-State. I don't need to visit, I'm going. What else do I need to do? Um, but she knew that I wanted that K-State experience and I credit that to her and the, um, it was the College of Human Ecology at the time, it's now College of Health and Human Sciences. Um, those advisors made a plan for me. They knew what I wanted and they made it happen. So that's how the Family Studies Human Services um, major came about. It impacted uh, my career for nursing and made sure that I was on the right track. I could graduate in four years, but also it focused on the people and I could also incorporate all of those science classes that I needed to meet those requirements for nursing school. So they made it happen and they made my K-State dream. So I. Um, highly credit the ability to be able to stay here at K-State and have those experiences to them. Um, also, incredible um, opportunities within several student organizations, um, SAB, the Honoraries, Mortarboard, Human Ecology Council, Wildcat Warmup, and a member of Alpha Chi Omega. These made my K-State experiences, and I wouldn't be where I am today without being involved in those leaders that I was able to learn from and grow from and gather those experiences. Um, it was an incredible ride for four years. I wish I could go back and do it again, um, but I credit all of them to where I'm at today. Um, so after my graduation from K-State, I did a nursing school at the other school, so had to make dad proud, um, and graduated with my BSN from 2011 to 2013. So I felt like I had made it. I achieved my dream. I was um, graduating with both my bachelor's degrees, and now it was on to the career. So what next? Um, I worked as a nurse associate in pediatrics and maternal child when I was a student at KU. Loved the kiddos. Um, it's a different environment when you're caring for kiddos that are sick. So 
not exactly my cup of tea, but um, it was a great experience, but I needed to focus on where was I gonna get those general skills that I could build, at, build on as a new graduate nurse. So next up was post-graduation. I got my first job right, um, before nursing school even ended, so it was incredibly exciting. I worked as an RN in the PACU, so the post-anesthesia care unit at KU, and I was caring for birth to adults, so babies up to um, 100 plus year old, so it was awesome. I got to really care for that whole age continuum of the little kiddos and also the older adults, so I got to put that secondary major in, ger in gerontology to use. Um, but as a lot in healthcare, we had very low staff to high patient ra um, ratio. I was a new graduate nurse, so there was a lot of training, a lot of learning, a lot of education involved. But with that low staff and high patient ratio, time was ticking. So there wasn't a lot of training time. Um, we got thrown into it pretty fast. They needed us on the floor and caring for those patients. So we were seeing about 175 surgeries per day, um, and it went fast. Time is money, um, and money is time was kind of the motto, which is not why I went into nursing. Um, I had a passion to care for people. I like to talk to people. I like to build those relationships. That was what was important to me. That's why I wanted to be a nurse, um, to really be there for them, to provide that comfort, that care, that emotional support. And that wasn't an option. Um, we had to get through those patients as fast as we could. So it was more about just using your hands and not your heart. So, and that's not where my heart was at. So it really changed my whole career progression. I actually at one point considered leaving the nursing field because I didn't find that joy and happiness, which is why I wanted to be a nurse. Like there wasn't that I want to go to work, I wanna see those patients, I wanna care for them because it was such a high demand, stressful job that the joy was gone. So what I had worked for six years for and had such a strict agenda was gone. Um, it was devastating. I felt like I was a failure. Um, didn't really know where life was gonna go next. I had a sister also in healthcare. Our dream was to someday work together, open a practice. I didn't think that was gonna be possible anymore. So now I have two degrees and what am I gonna do? I need a job. Um, it was, it was life-changing in a moment. But um, new beginnings, I ended up connecting with a case stater, lo and behold, um, that I met at the hospital who had started as a new graduate inpatient at KU as well, was going through the same struggles and challenges I was, and said, hey, I'm gonna try the ambulatory world. So I was like, okay, I never really considered ambulatory nursing. Um, I was really pushed to go to the inpatient side so you can get those general skills really hone in on those from the beginning before you went into a specialty practice. Um, I had been a nurse only for a year and a half, so to them I was still a baby nurse and still needed those experiences. So she's like, why don't, why don't you try it out, apply, see how it goes. Um, she goes, we can do this together. And I, like I said, she's a case stater I knew from K-State and then also um, went on to go to a nursing school at KU. So the connections, I was like, okay, she's a case stater, she's a good person, I'm gonna trust her, let's give it a go. So I ended up applying to a new department in ambulatory at KU where I worked in specialty care and allergy and internal medicine. So um, I also became the charge nurse after one year and relationships became a priority again. Um, I was seeing the same patients who were coming in for specialized testing, um, biological injections where they were getting either once a week, twice a month, um, sometimes multiple times a week. So I built relationships with these patients that honestly some became family. I had my first two kiddos while I was working in this job and actually had my patients um, give me baby showers for both of them. So that joy and happiness came back again. This is what I was meant to do. Like I really felt like I was put here to care for patients and I got that back. So it was an incredible opportunity to be able to build those relationships again and work with the individuals in internal medicine that I'm still with today. Um, new beginnings though also became new opportunities. I ended up staying five years in allergy. Um, I knew not a single thing about the allergy specialty um, when I became a nurse there, but they gave me a chance, they gave me a shot, and it became an absolute blessing in my life to get to meet these individuals and work with these patients because I fell in love with nursing all over again 
and was back to what my purpose really was. Um, I ended up getting promoted to a clinical care coordinator and clinical nurse educator for the entire internal, internal medicine department. So internal medicine encompasses 12 different specialty departments. So I work with 12 specialties in the ambulatory care um, unit as their educator. So I work with all the new hires and baby nurses, as we call them, in doing their training and hiring. So it all became full circle again. Um, what I felt like I kind of less, left out on and lost out on as a new graduate nurse, now I can make that happen for the new hires, the new nurses that were coming in, make sure that that passion and that joy was still there for them and made sure that they got a good experience um, coming out of um, nursing school and made sure that their dream still was still alive and I met their needs as well. So it really became full circle because I had been on the other side and I knew what was important to them and I now can make that happen as well. So um, I oversee on average 165 employees, um, again in the 12 clinical specialties. So um, it is a busy, busy place, but I love it more than ever because like I said, I can make sure that their experience is not what I had and what I learned from and make sure that that joy still stays with them. I'm responsible for all their education and training for all of the clinical staff. So anytime there's any new procedure, um, new equipment such as EKGs, um, injections, any new things that we're doing in the clinical areas, I'm responsible for teaching those to the staff. So I mainly work with registered nurses and our care coordinators um, and sometimes medical assistants and now students. And I'm now um, working with new BSN students or ADN um, nursing students that are coming into our programs as well. And kind of a fun thing, um, when I was in student alumni board, what I came to fall in love with was mentoring those new students. So um, events like for sophomores only and just for juniors, um, finding those passions and what they wanted to study. What did they want to do with their life? What career did they want? I loved talking to them about that because I had such a passion for K-State and loved my experiences. I wanted them to have the same. So kind of became full circle as now I'm mentoring the new clinical staff and students who are beginning RN BSN programs um, at surrounding schools in the Kansas City area. So it's been an absolute blast. Um, that's what I loved about K-State, one of the passions I found when I was here and now get to do it in my profession that brings me so much joy as well. So it all really became full circle. Um, life was good. I found my niche. I found what made me tick. Um, the joy was there. I liked going to work. Uh, my coworkers were incredible. My manager was over the top blessing for my life. And like everyone, COVID hit and it threw that world upside down. Um, new challenges. So um, big part of my job was creating those policies and procedures. Um, those were usually a couple times a year, you know, new equipment, um, new procedures that came in that I needed to train those nurses on. When COVID hit, it was multiple times a day that those could be changing. That I am trying to educate over 165 employees who have different roles in 12 different specialties. It was tough. Um, it was very tough. We were losing staff left and right um, to sickness or just the stress of it all. It was a challenge and it was really um, on the shoulders of myself because I needed to make sure that they knew how to care for their patients and keep their self safe as well who were going home to care for their families and their kiddos. So it was a lot. Um, we were in constant communication with the CDC and health system infection control team, making sure that our, we were doing the best practices for our employees as well as um, how to take care of themselves outside of being at work because we needed them to come back the next day and care for patients. Um, we are working with outside communities, schools, and health system on best practices. Um, we are maintaining patient needs with minimal staff. Some of our areas that had 20 to 30 nurses, we worked um, on patient care days with five of them. Um, we were seeing multiple, multiple areas just going down nurse by nurse because they were being exposed to it constantly, caring for the patients day after day. So we made it work though. Um, People were, we had to focus on protecting our staff. They had families to go home to. I had a family to go home to with um, two little kids. And I had a husband that worked in laboratory healthcare who was working 14 plus hours a day. So um, it was a very challenging time. Um, we're still facing it today. 
COVID is definitely not over in the healthcare world. Um, we still are adjusting our policies and procedures daily um, because things change. It's still there, um, but we made it. Um, so this quote, my sister always talked about this when she went into healthcare, and it's something I've never forgot. Um, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So she talked about this a little bit last night. Um, people are not gonna remember the awards you got, um, the titles that you have, what's on your resume, but they're gonna remember how you made them feel. So I always try to carry that with me in my heart when I'm caring for my patients and um, the people that I work with too. Um, they're not gonna remember the things that I did 10 years ago or what's on my resume or how many jobs and titles or certifications that I have, but they will remember how I made them feel and when I was there for them and their highest of highs or their lowest of lows. So that's something that I try to carry with me as a nurse every day and caring for my patients. And it was a trying time, but um, 10 years down the road, I'm still with internal medicine. I'm still with the same coworkers and, um, excuse me, team that gave me a chance. So never give up on your dreams. It may just not be the road or agenda that you stuck to, but um, life will definitely lead you down the road that you were meant to be, so. So how has K-State prepared me for my career? This was a tough one. Um, K-State gave me everything and more that I could have ever imagined. Um, I was receiving the top education. I was getting hands-on training from the get-go. Um, I was in Principles of Biology with Dr. Larry Williams, who, when I was interviewing for nursing school, knew about our programs and what I would be training on. Um, I had um, Human Body with Dana Townsend. Um, I think that's probably past your guys' time now with Dana, but um, we, that was an eight-hour class with A&P. And when I was visiting nursing schools, they knew exactly what I was talking about. They knew the education I was getting in biology and human body. And they, I still remember one of our advisors telling me at KU, they said, you will be miles ahead of your counterparts because of the education that you're gonna get. So I knew I was where I was supposed to be all along, but I received the top education that I ever could have possibly had and it made me successful in my career and still today. Um, the leadership skills are unmatched from the student alumni board to the honoraries to human ecology council, the leaders and the mentors and the people that you'll meet um, impacted my career. And still today, the things that I learned from them, the communication, their leadership styles, um, it's unsurmountable the, in the mentors and role models that you'll meet here. And I'll only touch on it briefly because it'll make me emotional, but Amy and Tammy and Andrea, incredible people. And so to student alumni board, take the time to get to know them because they will impact your life in ways that you never thought possible. They are truly special case staters who were here for us always in our highest of highs and lowest of lows. Um, they are tremendous leaders and just darn good people. I don't know how to say it any better than that, but thank you all because I wouldn't be here today without them. Um, the opportunities goes along with that. Um, it was hard to choose from. Um, there are so many opportunities at K-State to find your passion. Um, you wanna do everything. Four years seems like a long time, but it was so short. But the opportunities from honoraries to sororities and fraternities to um, bait club or skydiving club, um, they were insurmountable that you could choose from to find that passion, to find those joys, to find that thing that made you tick. And I was able to do that. Um, I did jump out of my comfort zone a little bit. I owe that to my sister Jamie though because she was out there and ready to go and I am not that type of person, but K-State pushed me to be. So now I can be out there, I can be that leader. I can do, have the communication skills and the leadership styles that I learned from K-State. So it pushed me um, to be where I'm at today and where I wanted to be and I'm forever thankful for that. So my advice to current and future K-State students, don't be afraid to change your path. Um, I had a very strict agenda. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew where I wanted to be and I knew how to get there. Once I got there though, it wasn't all that it surmounted up to be. So don't be afraid to change what you wanna do, but always focus on what gives you the passion and joy in your life because you're going to be doing this forever. So what you decide to do and what you decide to study, just make sure it brings you that joy and happiness that um, you'll be going into work to every day and be excited. 
have fun, but don't always have to, again, follow your agenda. Um, if I would go back, I would definitely try to relax a little bit more and just enjoy the experience, enjoy the ride. Again, it's so short, it's only four years. Um, academics were, are extremely important, but it's not the only part of the K-State experience. Um, coming from a small town of a graduating class of 52 people, um, I had a lot to learn. I had a lot of growing up to do, and K-State gave me that opportunity. So make sure you have fun, do the fun things, skydiving, studying abroad. You're not gonna get these chances again, so make the most of it. Um, and find your passion. I think I can't hone in on that enough. Um, like I said, my experience in student alumni board and mentoring those new students, um, I had no idea I liked to do those things. But I found that passion that I loved K-State so much and it had meant so much to me and given me so much that I wanted to give back to those two, um, new students. And now I do that with nursing because I, I found that passion and that joy in what I do today. And now I get to help new students um, who are coming into that field as well. So K-State will forever be your home. Stay connected. Um, the individuals that are, have helped you along the way, those mentors, those leaders, they will always be here. They will always be here for you. K-State is truly a family. Um, I've never met more unique and caring individuals than I have at K-State. Um, if I could come back here, I would do it today. Um, the experiences were incredible. So don't ever forget the people that helped you along the way and got you to where you wanted to be. Another quote that I have in my office, and my sister talks about a lot as well, um, to the world you may be one person, but to one person you may be the world. You never know the interactions and the impact you can make with people in your daily life. So take the time to really get to know people, not just um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but on a personal level. Um, the people that you will come across and that you will get to know could impact your life in ways that you'll never know or imagine until you really get to um, the time, the chance to know them and talk to them. So take the time to get to know people. Um, you may change their life forever and have no idea. And last, I'll leave you with these three kiddos who have loved their time here at K-State. And as I was going through the ends of my slides, and I was trying to think of what the best advice I could give to new students and current students. It's like there's so much to talk about and what K-State has given me. And my seven-year-old Carly here said, um, the best advice that you can give to students is be nice and go to K-State. And I said, I can't argue with that. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, this is an extraordinary opportunity and a moment I'll treasure forever. So thank you so much. Oh, yes. Any questions I can answer? Absolutely. Um, I think it kind of goes back to that quote. Make sure you keep people at the center of your forefront. Um, really getting that emotional connection with your patients. Um, I can't hone in that on that enough because healthcare is ever changing and drastically firing at rapid speeds right now. The developments and COVID, like uh, there's so many more developments that are going on that's requiring your care, but we forget about the people that who we're taking care of. Make sure you think about the emotional connections, the family that need the care as well, um, and keeping that, that love in your heart and why you're really meant there and why you wanted to be there in the first place. Um, make sure you think of them and not just what you're doing with your hands and your mind. Science and medicine gives, has given us so many tools but the tool, probably most of what led you to healthcare is because you wanna care for people. So keep that emotional connection with them and always keep them at the forefront of your mind when you're caring for them. Sure. During COVID times when you were spending those 14 hour plus days in the hospital, how did you balance that with home life? It was extremely hard and my family, I can't thank them enough. They're only a couple hours away, so we had to reach out for some help for sure. Uh, my husband works in clinical laboratory and he works nights. So there was a lot of passing by of each other in the night and doing what we could to still be there for our kiddos who, 
as you know, schools were closed at some of the um, portion of time. So my family was the one that I credit all that for. I could not have done that without them. Um, and they were spending many, many hours on the road in between our houses and doing what they could to help us out. So um, if it wasn't for my family, I don't know, to be honest. So, sure. As someone who's like had an agenda and goals and a plan for the future and motivated by that, what's next? Or if not, when did you like come to peace with you're happy with where you're at? And like, how does that vision and goal setting play in where you're at? That's the perfect question. I was just talking with someone at my job the other day because we have, of course, your annual evals, and mine had just come up um, shortly after Christmas. And it's always, what are your goals? What do you want to do next? Um, I found my joy. I found my niche in that happiness as being a clinical nurse educator. And I don't ever see myself doing anything else. Um, I have that perfect family work-life balance. My manager is an extreme blessing to my life who I'm able to be flexible with my kiddos and go to their activities and be there for the important stuff while they're young. Um, so I don't see a next for me. And I know I'm young to say that and there's always should be a goal or planning in time, but I found what brings me that joy. And so um, I don't think there's a next three, but you never know. That door is always open. You never know the possibilities or opportunities that might be knocking at your door. And so I'm definitely open to that. But right now, like you said, I'm at peace with where I'm at because of the happiness that it brings me. Sure. So you said in college, if you could change something, it would be to you know have some more fun or uh, maybe relax a bit more. Obviously, fun and relaxation doesn't end after college. So what do you do now to have fun, explore, um, and relax. <laughs> well, there's not much relaxing because I've got these three kiddos, but they are my fun. They are my joy and happiness for sure. Um, they're in lots of different activities, cheer and softball, and the oldest plays football and dance. So that is my joy now in their activities and getting to watch them grow. Um, not much relaxing, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, they love to come to K-State. I've talked to you a lot about the biggest thing um, this uh, past couple days was just coming to swim and check out their man happiness, as they call it. So um, that's kind of where we're at today. Lots of activities. Sure. What kind of K-State do you want for your children when they come here? Oh, my gosh. What you guys have right now. It is <laughs> unreal. Um, the opportunities that you guys have, the clubs. Um, Hale Library just blew my mind yesterday. I know that the kiddos are gonna have the necessary tools and resources to be successful. Um, the study rooms at Hale Library, oh my gosh, what I would have done to have those in that quiet space. Um, and we, we went into some of the different labs and the hands-on training, like um, there's even uh, majors and minors that didn't even exist when I was here. So if it could be like it is for you guys now, I know they will be successful because there is unsurmountable opportunities here for them and study opportunities. So I sure keep that going because you guys have done a great job um, in making K-State a better place than it was when we were here. And it was pretty darn awesome when we, heard, we were here. So I couldn't even imagine that it got better, but you guys did it, so keep it going. Sure. What have you learned through managing such large and different groups of people? Everyone is different. Um, there's people that have very different um, leadership styles themselves and learning styles. Um, that's been different to me. I am a pretty black and white person. Um, like I like it set straight in stone, give it to me straight, and that's how I learn best. Um, everyone has different learning styles. We're all, all at different levels in our career, and we all got a different education. So um, that hit was really challenging um, for a new position for me, and I still learn all the time because everyone is different. Um, and how I can best train them, whether it's in person, is it hands-on, is it reading material, what, um, what ways do they learn best? Because these are things that they're gonna be doing on their own and caring for patients, so it's obviously of high importance. So I think that's been the most challenge is learning um, how people learn best and make sure that they can be successful. Any more? Yeah. What's a favorite K-State memory of yours? Oh gosh, favorite K-State memory. That's a tough one. Um, 
And I, I know sports are always a big one, but football has been such a big part of my life since I was a little kid. And um, we still have season football tickets. So that's a, probably one of my favorite memories is K-State football. But I would think, I think joining a sorority was one of my favorite K-State memories. It's not something I thought I would ever do. Um, coming from a small town, it was pretty scary to join a group that size. But I met so many wonderful people in that organization that I think in my wedding, actually my bridesmaid were represented five different sororities, if I remember right. So it, it was one of my favorite memories was getting to meet all of those people from different areas, different experiences. Um, that, was, that was pretty life changing. Oh, I guess, well, I wasn't a student at K-State, but I did get engaged in Bosco Student Plaza, so that's a pretty big one. <laughs> um, and wa oh, Wildcat warm-up, oh my gosh, that was a huge one. Uh, I was a director, actually, with Danielle here sitting today, a director for two years in, oh my gosh, the memories that we had. Um, it feels like yesterday. I wish, that's something I probably wish I could go back to. That is definitely one of my favorite memories. Um, growing with those leaders, and that's when we had time to, we worked really hard, but during that summer, we had a lot of fun too, so that was the time I got to relax and really enjoy K-State, so. All right, well, thank you everyone so much for being here today, I appreciate you all. Okay, well, thank you, Kelsey, so much. This concludes our program for this evening, and we'd like to once again thank John and Kelsey for coming out, um, taking time out of your hectic schedules to come join us back in Manhattan. And it's really an honor for all of us here to hear from two alums who are already making such exceptional strides in your professional careers. Um, and I think we do have a QR code, so if you feel so inclined, please give us some feedback from the DYA program this year. But thank you all for coming, and have a safe night.